Hello everyone. In this lecture, we'll be learning about dynamic power consumption, uh, power consumption in meters. That is, uh, the switching power consumption and how we can minimize the switching power, how we can minimize the loss. And we'll see. A, we'll start with an example of switching power, and we'll progress on to how what are the factors that play effective role in switching power consumptions. Now let us look at an example of dynamic power consumption in a circuit. Uh, in this example, the problem statement says we have 1 billion transistor, of which 50 million are logic transistors and 90 million are memory transistors. The parameters of the logic and memory transistors are different. The average width of logic transistors are 12 lambda, where the activity factors are 0.1. The average width of memory transistors are 4 lambda, and the activity factor is 0.2. Uh, the uh, technology has a 1 fourth of VDD at 65 nanometer pulses, the capacitance at gate is 1 third per micrometer and that, that is, the, this is the capacitance per micron and so diffusion capacitance per micron is 0.8 femtofarad, so total capacitance per micron is 1.8 uh, femtofarad by micrometer and uh, it has been given that lambda is equal to 25 nanometer. 25 nanometer is equal to 0 0.025 micrometers. And we are converting it micrometers because we have to consider all of these using the same units. Now, obviously, since the width of 50 million uh, logic transistors and the width of memory transistors are different, the capacitance of them will also be different. The capacitance of logic transistors would be 1.8 femtofarad per micrometer into uh, our width is 12 lambda 12 the value of lambda is 0 0.025 into so we have this uh, femtofarad per micrometer into micrometer so those micrometers will be cancelled and the result will get increased in femtofarads now we have 50 millions of such, such transistors so we have to multiply it by 50 into 50 power 6 if we make all the calculations we will get 20, uh, we'll get <coughs> 20, uh, 27 nanofarads. 27 nanofarads. Again, uh, our capacitance of uh, capacitance of the memory transistors would be 1.8 into 4 lambda. Since we are 4 lambda, 4 into 0 0.025, and the number is 950 millions. So. 950 into 10 to the power 6. Uh, after calculation, we will find out that uh, the value of this becomes 171 nanofarad. Now, the activity factor of logic transistor is 0.1 and the activity factor of memory transistor is 0 0.02. We know P switching is equal to F into C into <coughs> VDD squared into alpha. In both cases, the alpha and C vary, but the F and VDD squared remain same. So we get total power switching is equal to our frequency is equal to 1 gigahertz, 1 into 10 to the power 9 hertz into uh, VDD is 1 volt, so we get 1 squared into we get for the logic transistors, we get C is equal to 27 into 10 inverse 9, 27 nano into alpha is equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.1 and for memory transistors we get 171 into 10 inverse 9 and into alpha is equal to 0 0.02. So after this calculation we will get the switching power or P dynamic power, switching power or dynamic power as 6.1 watt. So the total dynamic power consumption is 6.1 watt. It is to be made, uh, noted that here the 1 gigahertz is the clock frequency which we have applied here, and the short circuit current, short circuit current or the short circuit power has been negligible or has uh, has been neglected, and as a result, the entire dynamic power is actually the switching power, and the short circuit component is zero. Now let us estimate the activity factor. As we have learned earlier, the activity factor depends on whether a MOSFET is switched on or off. 
So, whether a MOSFET will be switching depends on the probability of its input to be, uh, to be either high or low. So, we are considering here uh, an example of NAND gate. In case of NAND gate, we have two PMOS in parallel and two NMOS in series. We have the inputs AB, AB here. Now, uh, whether uh, the switching power of this MOSFET, switching power of this MOSFET will depend on whether the, this MOSFET is being switched on or off or whether this MOSFET is idle. If this MOSFET is idle, there will be no switching power. But if this is being switched on and on or off, there will be power dissipation, uh, switching power dissipation. Now, whether this MOSFET will be turned on or off will actually depend on the probability of whether this input over here will be 0 or 1 or whether there is a change in this input. So, let us assume that the probability of input A to rise that is to be 1 is Pi. Then the probability of this uh, being 0 is P, uh, 1 minus Pi. Obviously, Pi bar is equal to 1 minus Pi. And the activity factor under consideration is Pi into Pi bar. This is, the pro uh, this is actually the probability that this a, there is a change in this node A. Now, for a completely random data, uh, the A can be either switched on or switched off. That is, the probability can be 0 0.5. Probability is 0 0.5 and alpha is equal to 0 0.25. But uh, the data in uh, real life are not completely random. For example, uh, suppose we are, uh, we are considering a bank account and we are using 16 digits, 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, like this we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We have 16 digit to store, these 16 digit to store the bank account number and here, here, uh, you're depositing say like 50,000 or 80,000. So, you're using these 5 bits. If you deposit in lakhs, you'll be using this. If you, if you deposit 10 lakhs or 1 crore, you'll be using these digits. So, as we can see, you'll be using more often than not, you'll be using the smaller bits of the smaller bits of the or the smaller digits of the whole whole number, and the larger digits will be affected at a very lower rate. So, in real life, like this, for 64 bit words, the larger bits will be updated or switched at a very lower rate, and the probability of these being changed is very low, and the probability of this being changed are very high. Uh, the lower bits being changed are very high. So, as a result, the data is not completely random and the probability is not always 0.5. Uh, in case of logic gates and the nodes, generally the activity factor is very low, lower than 0.25. The activity factors are in the range of 0.1. Now, let us look at probability of some of the some of the logic gates that we use. The two input logic gate has a probability a total probability of PA into PV. PA is the probability of input A being switched on and PV is the probability of input B being switched on. For 3 input AND gate, we have PA, PV, PC. Uh, for OR gate, we have 1 minus PA bar, PV bar. We have to remember this table. AND gate, 1 minus PA, PV. NOT to gate, PA bar, PV bar. And XOR gate, PA, PV bar plus uh, PA bar, PV. So we have to remember uh, remember the switching probabilities. Which will, these switching probabilities will be helpful when we actually go on and measure the activity factor. Now let us consider an example of finding the activity factor of a circuit. Here we have a, a four input AND gate which is built using two two input NAND gates over here and here, and the outputs of these NAND gates are inverted here and then uh, we, it passes through the AND gate. So what happens is our actual circuit is like this. We have this NAND gate and after that we have inverter. Similarly, we have this NAND gate over here and after that we have an inverter and this whole thing goes into the input of an AND gate. Here we have A, B, C, so now it is. Uh, now we have to consider that uh, it is said that each of the nodes have the probability of 0.5. That is, probability of A is 0.5, B is 0.5, C and D all are 0.5. Now, from the earlier sides, uh, if you are considering this node, say we name this node N1. For N1, 
from the earlier slide we have known that probability is equal to 1 minus PAPB because this is an AND gate. If it is 1 minus PAPB, we get 1 minus uh, PA is half, PB is half. That is 1 minus 1 by 4 is equal to 3 by 4. If probability is 3 by 4, P bar is equal to, we have 1 by 4 and alpha is equal to 3 by 4 into 1 by 4. That is 3 by 16. So, for the node N1 here, P is equal to 3 by 4, alpha is equal to 3 by 16. Again, in this case, this is also similar, P will be equal to 3 by 4, alpha is, will be equal to 3 by 16. Now, we can see that the input of this AND gate is inverted. That is, if the probability at this point was, uh, probability at this point was 3 by 4, the probability of it, the input of this would be 1 by 4 uh, because the input is inverted. So, and the probability of this input will also be 1 by 4. And this is, so, here the probability is N1, 3 by 4. After the NOT gate, we have 1 by 4. Again, here after the NOT gate, here we have 3 by 4. And after the NOT gate, we have 1 by 4. Now, this is an AND gate and the probability is equal to PAPV. So, total probability would be 1 by 4 into 1 by 4, that is 1 by 16. And if probability is 1 by 16, probability bar would be 15 by 16. So, our activity factor alpha would be 1 by 16 into 15 by 16 is equal to 15 divided by 256. Uh, when we are told to measure the uh, measure the switching power of this uh, switching power loss of this circuit or dynamic power of this circuit, we have to use activity factor alpha as 15 divided by 256, and we have to uh, do all the cal calculations accordingly. Now, dynamic power is actually the power loss, or we call it the switching loss. And obviously, since this is loss, we want to minimize this. How can we minimize this? There are four components, alpha, C, B, D, D, and F. By minimizing the activity factor or the capacitance or the supply voltage or the frequency, uh, we can actually minimize the, the actual switching power. We'll be learning about how we can minimize this very shortly. Now, the first stage of, uh, first way of minimizing the switching power or the dynamic power is to minimize the activity factor. And we can minimize the activity factor by clock gating. In order to minimize activity factor by clock gating, we have to we have to know which resistor is idle and when it is idle. If the resistor is idle, we completely we do not pass the clock to it, and as a result, there is no switching involved in the resistor uh, register or logic. For example, this is our logic device, and this is our clock. So, in case of clock gator, what we use is we use an AND gate and inside in, in the AND gate, we one of the input of the AND gate is the clock itself and the other input is an in enable logic. That is, if we know that this block will be idle, we'll set up the logic in such a way that here we'll get zero. If here we get zero, we get the output as zero and we this logic does not get any clock signal. But if we know that at this moment this logic gate will not be idle, then what we can do is we can enable here. If we enable here, the clock signal, whatever the signal is, it will go to the logic block and the logic will act accordingly. That is, by clock gating, we are making, uh, we are ensuring a process in which this block does not always work. This block works or this block switches only when it is necessary for it to switch, when only when this block is active. And by doing so, if we didn't clock didn't use clock gating, this this block will be working continuously. That is, this block will be switching on and off and on and off with the clock. But use, if you are using the clock gator, we can uh, make it operational whenever it is necessary, and we can make it stop operating whenever this is idle. And by doing so, we can actually minimize the power consumed, the overall power consumed, or the overall switching power. The second way by which we can actually uh, decrease the switching power loss is by changing or decreasing the capacitance. Now, there are two types of capacitance that will be involved, the gate capacitance and the wire capacitance. The gate capacitance would be uh, 
lower if the stages of logic that is number of MOSFETs or logic gates are low and if the gate sizes are very small and the wire, wire capacitance can be uh, can be uh, can be minimized by good flow flow panning and the long wires will have to be driven by inverters or buffers rather than complex gates and uh, we ha we have to make sure that the wires are not really long because the length of the wire will uh, if the length of the wire is greater they will uh, indicate that the capacitance is uh, capacitance is more so by designing the layout of the circuit uh, in a very calculated way in a very sophisticated way we can actually con we can actually uh, control both gap gate capacitance and wire capacitance. And the last things we can control in order to control the uh, in order to minimize the uh, switching power is that we uh, we can control the voltage and frequency so in order to control the voltage and frequency one thing we can do is we can run each block to the lowest possible voltage and frequency that meets the performance requirement that is suppose we have this one block which runs on low uh, logic volts, uh, logic of 5 volts. We have this another block which works on logic of 3.3 volts. So we will have to make such arrangement that we will supply 5 volts to this input and 3.3 volts to this input uh, or this block. So we have to keep separate uh, separate voltage sources for separate blocks. For example, in in this circuit here we have VDDH. And here we have VDDL. So we require different voltage sources and by applying different voltage sources, we are considering that the minimum value of the voltage uh, which uh, meets the performance requirements is being used. And we can also do dynamic voltage scaling. Uh, how we can do that? We can adjust the le voltage level VDD or the frequency according to the workload. If the workload is more, we will give more VDD and if the workload is low, we'll, uh, we'll control the frequency. We have a block called dynamic voltage uh, scaling controller. In this controller, depending upon the workload, the voltage will be controlled, frequency will be controlled. So from the logic, it will get input of workload and temperature and it will decide whether the, uh, decide the frequency, minimum value of frequency and voltage which can be used. And this, this information, the frequency information will be passed, passed to the logic itself and the voltage control information will be passed to the switching voltage regulator. So as a result this VDD will be modified depending upon the requirement of the core logic block and the frequency will also be modified depending upon the workload. That is if the workload is very large we have to decrease the frequency and we have to increase the voltage control. If the workload is very low we can increase the frequency and we can uh, decrease the voltage. That is how we can actually manipulate the voltage or frequency components and uh, we can manipulate the switching power. That's all for this lecture. Thank you so much. In the next lecture, we will be learning about static power dissipation.